we can say, but the glory of the Lord rise among us. The glory of the Lord rise among us. The praises of the King rise among us. They arise. But the songs of the Lord rise among us. And the songs of the
The devotional that I'm bringing you today is aptly entitled Jesus Drive By or Walk To. Today I wanted to answer the all important question I know it's been bringing in your mind. If Jesus were down on earth, would he walk or drive? Right? You've asked that. I wanted to point out some of the pros and cons on each decision. But of course, him being Jesus, he would always make the right decision. So, but nonetheless, I wanted to take both sides and see what we can learn. So let's just discuss the driving decision first. Well, for starters, what kind of car would he drive? There we go. The sports car. Wow. Just to think how fast Jesus could get around with it. Go here, go there, stop here. Sounds great, right? Oh, but wait a minute. If he were traveling that fast, how could he see those in need? And how could he look into their faces of pain and suffering and offer hope going that fast? Wouldn't their faces just be a blur? No, no. A sports car wouldn't work. So let's move on. Oh, now we're talking. Okay. Yeah. Jesus riding in style. A plush limo with all the fixes. Plenty of tinted windows and room to stretch out after a long day. Oh, no, I didn't think of this. No. Uh, Jesus is the light of the world, right? And because of him, heaven needs no light. He is the light. So how could he hide behind tinted windows and never be able to show that? Mm. No, I guess the limb is out too. I'm sorry about that. Well, okay, let's let's move on to another one. Yeah. <laughs> so this we got Jesus, 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 Jesus. There's no way that can stop him. There's no way to stop him. He can roll over every obstacle, sit way up high and look down, see the big picture. Haul all his items around with never a thought <laughs> being weighed down with a safe sucks, exactly. But wait, <laughs> but wait, I, I'm sorry. Again, I didn't take this into account. Jesus would never want to be a, that far away from those he loved. I mean, being in a monster truck, how would he be able to see the eyes, see his eyes of love? Reach down and heal them and meet them at the most desperate place. No, I guess that option to drive is a hard one. I, I guess there's... Oh, but you know what? One thing I want to tell you guys I forgot to mention. We're not even talking about the dangers. Even, you know, him being the Lord, I understand. But the dangers that are on the road. <laughs> what do you say? It's, 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 it's a <laughs> no. That's okay. That's not it. We'll go back. One second. Oh. Yes. <laughs> I have these as slide numbers, so. It's all right. Play it again. Play the audio one more time. Get the effect. There we go. Road rage. That's pretty easy. You, the face of road rage. Yeah. Like the picture says, it isn't pretty. Look at all the hostility of the angle. Isn't driving supposed to be a pedal? Well, if you look at that face, I don't think so. But the good news is that Jesus met this guy on the street. Remember. Christ is the Prince of Peace. Now, let's go to the next one. We saw a little bit of a preview. So I think we could uh, all deal with this. But Steve? <laughs> there, no, that's not about Steve. Sunny Drive. There we go. Oh, Sunny Drive. Who could that be? Well, you know. I was going to say, you know, we love them, don't we? They have the phrases like, how long is my rear blinker going on? You know, did I leave the stove on? Wait a minute, I only on my microphone. And the most famous, flip flops are fine in the snow, as long as you hop. So, uh, well, there may be sunny drivers that you meet from the church or on the road are different. But one thing is same, give them plenty of room. The good news, again, is that perfect peace is fine, stay at home, day. And we say, the final danger. The most dangerous thing that you just saw, probably. <coughs> Steve. <laughs> Look at this thing. Oh, no. Yes. Oh, distracted divas. They can be man or woman, young or old, but they all have one thought in mind. This information that I had to send or receive, it can't wait. What if I don't see what the hottest Twitter account was this second? What just happened on Facebook? It's only accessing it five seconds ago. And what, no service? That's impossible. I paid $800 for this value phone. Well, we see it every day with technology become accessible. Final thought, Jesus said, come and I will give you rest. And yes, even rest for those devices. Now, you know, it's funny, Angel was reading the, um, I just was going to add this in, Angel was reading the um, Daily Bread. It's funny, it came talking about Jesus was 
you know, it's going to give you the rest of the scripture. Just confirmation, I thought it was amazing. But I, you know, I've had fun with Pastor and Wanda and Angel, and you know, they, we know that they're good drivers. And I just wanted to make a point that we had some fun. But now I want to ask you a favor to open your hearts for a second and really hear what I'm about to say. This is about the scripture verse, Luke 24, 32. And it said, And they said to one another, Did not our hearts burn within us while he talked with us along the way? And while he opened up the scriptures? He explained the scriptures before and time. So, so all these things, the precedent, he was, this is the resurrection. He was still going to see Jesus. And, and, and he met a stranger along the road. And he kept asking him, you know, what's been happening? He said, you must be a stranger. Have right? you seen, heard about, Je you know, Jesus the prophet? And he talked with them. And then it wasn't until he came a little bit later and broke bread with them that they realized it was him. And they said in their hearts, you know, didn't, while they walked with him and talked to him, do you understand what I'm trying to say is that it couldn't have been in a car. You know, could you see Jesus like, all right now, Luke, you know, behave yourself. Now. I'll pull this car over. Could you see, you know, Matthew, don't pet, you know, don't pet John. He couldn't have did that. He had to walk with him and see and talk with him and walk along. And think about this. That the Lord of glory cared about what those men said. What their opinions and how they spoke to Jesus. Did you ever think that? You know, I just wanted you to move on now to walking. How wonderful it was that he did. I wanted to bring up some points of that. He walked in the temple and grew in wisdom and understanding. The scriptures for you and I. To show how he must be about his father's business. At the banks of Jordan, Jesus walked to Jesus. Um, excuse me, walked to John the Baptist to be baptized. To fulfill all righteousness and to hear the words that this is my beloved son and whom I am well pleased. As the cranes possessed man named Legion Watch, Jesus walked to him and cleansed him from a multitude of unclean deeds that inhabit his body and brought him peace like no other could ever do. People of various incurable diseases saw the man named Jesus walk to them sick and dying and cure them instantaneous and by following the word of the Lord. Those in the boat at night saw Jesus walk to them, all the way, being amazed and terrified until they realized it was him. And then they saw Peter walk to Jesus on the water, and Jesus walked to Peter to save him from sinking. And also, for, for the love of all mankind, the Savior walked the streets of Jerusalem, carrying a cross, and made sure he walked to that hill called Golgotha, where he laid down his life and sacrificed for us. And my favorite. Sometimes we don't realize that the king of light and love walked to the, through a place of darkness and evil so he could take away the keys of death and hell and the grave that we could live with him in his resurrection. And finally, those who are saved to Christ will one day see Jesus as he walks to his beloved and says, Well done, thy good and faithful servant. And to the of your That walk we will make Where Jesus sent the sunset, just a closer walk with him. Granted, Jesus is on the way. Daily walking, not just one time, but daily walking close to him. Let it be.
love, baggage, and weight on you. He says, but I have come to give you life and give it to you more abundantly, more completely, more fully. And with that being said, I want you to understand that through this next little while, however long this is up, because I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to do something with all this baggage at the end. It's gonna, it's, we're going to deal with this baggage when it's all said and done. But until God directs me to do it at that time, I thought that we need to leave it here to where if you come in, let's say, for instance, you may have wrote something down last week and put in this bag. Maybe you weren't here last week. If you weren't here last week, you need to go watch the message that we, that, that, that we proclaimed about the baggage last week on our Vimeo page or YouTube page. But maybe you, you so there's some other baggage that grabbed a hold of you this week. And maybe you just need to, just, just as, as a visual thing of writing it down, folding it up, and then later, you know, I'll, if you have it, you just fold it, put it on there, I'll take care of it, put, put it in the suitcase. A ceiling up about giving our baggage over to him. Because many of us, we, we come up and we lay the baggage down, but the problem is many times, what we do, we pick the baggage up again. There, there's a lot of baggage that's in this thing. I didn't know how many people came up last week. But as I was editing the video at home, I began to see. And I was saying, oh, Lord. Because when I looked in after service, I saw all the pieces of paper that were in here. And folks, I'm here to tell you, Jesus came to set you free from this. He came to deliver you from this. But the problem is too many times we go and we pick up the baggage again. We, we grab a hold of it and, 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 and we get good intentions. We come up and we, we, we try to leave it at the altar. We try to leave it at the foot of the cross. But for some reason or another, we allow that baggage to come back on us. And, and that leads to a very frustrating life. It leads to a life of where as Tommy said in the video, he says it's it doesn't feel like I'm free. It doesn't feel like I'm walking in, in, in the joy that, that, that you want me to, to live in more, but too many times when we pick it back up and it's going to be especially dangerous <coughs> or a greater tragedy. The baggage we pick back up is sin. See, sometimes some of the baggage we may put in here may not have been sin. Some of you may have actually wrote down some sins and put them in here because they, they're constantly weighing you down. But it's, it's very tragic when all of a sudden we, we, we pick it up again. But I want to look at a message today that God gave to Jeremiah to proclaim to the people of Judah. And then I'm going to look at a message that Paul spoke to, to the church at Colossus, to the Colossians. And I want to see what the Word has to say, because I think there's something that, that, that we need to understand, because unfortunately, I think some of us are living the life that's being said here in Jeremiah and in Colossians. Some of us were, 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 were we. I don't know where we may have developed these I don't have an idea where we may have developed some of these attitudes and these thought processes. But I think it's something that we need to hear. And it especially makes it hard for me to go, again, I, I proclaim the truth to you. And I just have to tell you again what the Lord's laid upon my heart this morning. I'm, try, I'm trying to be very, very conscious of the time. So I'm encouraging you this morning to let it go. Let it go. You know, the Frozen movie that's under here, let it go, let it go. Na, 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 na. Let it go, let it go. I know that part of the song. <laughs> but I'm gonna tell you right. I'm gonna tell you right off the bat. This isn't gonna be a shout message. This is a soul searching message. Because too many times we have we have too we have too many churches. Preaching a sugar-coated gospel. Mm -hmm. Trying to give the medicine, as Mary Poppins says, a spoonful of sugar helps the medicine go down. The medicine go down. The medicine go down. We're trying to sugarcoat something that, let's be honest, 
It can taste very bitter. It doesn't taste good. It doesn't feel good. As many medicines do not. But they cure what they're supposed to do. They take care of what they're supposed to take care of. So to just follow on with me today. In Jeremiah chapter 7, verses 1 through 4, here, here's, here's the scene that we're looking at. I don't know if you know anything first I don't know if you know anything about Jeremiah. Jeremiah was the prophet who was, who was prophesying to the kingdom of Judah. Uh, at this time, Israel and Judah had divided. You had the, you had the kingdom of Israel, who, was, who kept the name Israel. Um, and then you had the kingdom of Judah, who comprised the name of Judah. And um, I think Benjamin may have went with them. There, there were two tribes that went with the kingdom of Judah, and the other ten went with Israel. And Jeremiah was prophesying to the king of Judah. Judah's now, they're, they're, they're in some bad shape. Um, they're supposed to be God's people. They're supposed to be doing things and living for him. And, but but they're, they're in some bad shape. And, and Jeremiah delivers this message to them. He says, the Lord gave another message to Jeremiah. He said, go to the entrance of the Lord's temple and give this message to the people. Old Judah, listen to the message from the Lord. Listen to it, all you who worship here. For this is what the Lord of heaven's armies, the God of Israel, says. Even now, if you quit your evil ways, I will let you stay in your own land. But don't be fooled by those who promise you safety simply because the Lord's temple is here. They chant, the Lord's temple is here. The Lord's temple is here. See, as I said before, God, God here, he, He's still offering what? He's offering mercy before judgment. As God always is, no matter, no matter what you do in your life, God will always offer you mercy for He will bring wrath and judgment down upon you. He will always offer you forgiveness before punishment. Because it is His desire to do what? His, it's His desire to have you reconciled to Him. To have your life straightened out with Him. That's His desire. That's why so many times, especially if you've experienced the Lord, where it seems like if you go to do something you're not, you know you're not supposed to do, it's always nagging at you. And see, that's God trying to tell you, hey, straighten up. Let go of the baggage. Let it go. Come to me. He says, I have an awesome plan for you. Because he says there, what does he say? He says, even now, if you quit your evil ways, I will let you stay in your own land. See, prophecies start to come where they say, Judah, you're going into captivity. Your lifestyle, you know, even though you may sit there and say, hey, this can't. See, too many times, like with these people, too many times people try to sit there. My, 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 my uh, things acting up a little bit. They, they sit there and, and, and think, well, you know, well, I go to church, so everything's okay. God prophesied this about me, so everything's okay. But I'm here to tell you, it does not work that way because God here is getting ready to deal with these individuals who think this way. Because He says, don't be fooled by those who promise you safely simply because the temple's here. See, they did have the, the mindset that nothing could ever happen to Jerusalem because the temple of God was there. Because they could read throughout their history like how He dealt with Hezekiah and how He, he delivered Hezekiah from Shennacherib, the king of Assyria, and, and for Jehoshaphat and different ones like that. How God defended the city because His name was there. But God is telling says, you know, don't sit there. Don't be fooled by those who promise you safety simply because the Lord's temple was here. Because He goes on and says in verses 5 through 11, He says, but I will be merciful only if you stop your evil thoughts and need and start treating each other with justice. Only if you stop exploiting foreigners, orphans, and widows. Only if you stop your murdering. Only if you stop harming yourselves by worshiping idols. Then I will let you stay in this land that I gave you, that I gave to your ancestors and keep forever. Don't think. Don't be fooled into thinking that you will never suffer because this temple was here. It's a lie. I'm going to stop there a second. We may sit there and say, well, well, Pastor, you know, none of us are murdered. Also. But the thing is, he said, there, you stop worshiping idols. Worshiping idols in the modern day is putting what we think over what God says. 
of us created, well, I think God says this. No, if it goes contrary to the word of God, you're worshiping a false idol. If, you're, if your thought process is going contrary to what the word teaches, you're creating a false God. And you're worshiping idols. And God said he can't bless you that way. He won't allow you to stay in the land. He won't allow his blessings to stay upon you. See, many of us, through the lives that we live, we actually sacrifice. And through a lot of these, these times, the children of Israel were sacrificing their children to false gods. Don't you realize that when, when so-called Christians are doing today? They're literally, but am I not truly living for God the way they should? Not truly living for Jesus the way they should? They're literally offering up their children to the God of this world. They're offering as a sacrifice to them. We sit and say, well, well, we don't do it. Yes, you do. You do it by how you're living your life, but not living the life of being the child of God that he's called you to be. And you allow the world to come in and, and do things in the life of your children you should never allow to be done, which can be stopped if you were truly living the standard of righteousness that God has called you to live. This is what he says in verse 9. Do you really think you can steal, murder, commit adultery, lie, burn incense to Baal and all those, all those other new gods of yours, and then come here and stand before me in my temple and chant, we are safe only to go right back to all those evils again? See, that, that's one thing I hate about this, this so-called doctrine of eternal security, no matter what you do. I'm here to tell you, it's a lie. Because God here himself, he speaks out and gives, he says, you cannot come to me and bless me on one hand and go and do whatever you want on the other hand. Right. Yeah. He says, don't you yourselves admit that this temple which bears my name has become a den of thieves? Surely I see all the evil going on here. I, the Lord, have spoken. And then he goes to give them an example of what he means and what he will do. See, too many times we try to rely upon certain things. We try to sit there and say, well, God said this, he said that, so I, I'm, I'm cool, I'm okay. Hey, but, but there, there's a two parts to that covenant, there's a two parts to that relationship. God will live up to his end as long as you live up to your end. He is merciful and forgiving, yes. And when, when you realize you faltered and failed, you need to go to him and say, God, I'm sorry. And you need to make sure that it is a repentant heart. But here's what he tells him in verse 12, verses 12 through 15. He says, Now go to the place at Shiloh, where I once put the tabernacle that bore my name. See what I did there? See what I did there because of all the wickedness of my people, the Israelites? And see, by this time, the kingdom of Israel has already fallen. The kingdom of Israel has already been destroyed and already taken away into captivity. And, and, and Judah's lasted now for about a hundred and some years after that. And God has been constantly pleading with Judah. Turn from your wicked ways. Turn from your wicked ways. See, only the kingdom of Judah ever had even good kings. All the kings of Israel were evil. All the kings of Israel led the people down the wrong road. All the kings of, evil, of Israel led the people away from the true God of Israel. And that's what we need to be careful. We need to make sure that, 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 that when we go someplace, when we go to a church, whatever, we need to make sure that the man that's standing by the, behind the pulpit is truly proclaiming what thus saith the Lord. Amen. We need to make sure that their word is rooted and grounded in the word of God. It doesn't matter what modern opinion is. And granted, I know sometimes we need to have things to where we understand, you know, how do we handle the situation? Like the different guys like Andy, Andy Stanley also who, who teach to the moment. But guys, we also need to understand what the scripture says. And we need to know what kind of life God expects of us. We need to know the kind of life that God will give us if we truly give our heart and our soul to Him. We just can't sugarcoat this stuff. And we just can't simply say, why well, I'm fine, you're fine, we're all fine. God just wants us to be happy. He says, while you were doing these wicked things, says the Lord, I spoke to you about it repeatedly. But you would not listen. I called out to you, but you refused to answer. So I destroyed Shiloh. 
I will now destroy this temple that bears my name, this temple that you trust in for help, this place that I gave to you and your ancestors, and I will send you out of my sight into exile, just as I did your relatives, the people of Israel. He, said, he says, Judah, listen up. I didn't spare, or spare the nation of Israel. He says, they had all their trust in Shiloh, where the the, the tabernacle of the congregation was. See, that was that was the tabernacle of what? That God had Moses build. That was, that was the tabernacle that traveled with them through the wilderness that had the pillar of cloud by day and the pillar of fire by night over it. It was the one that when, when, when the glory of the Lord settled down upon it, that, that, that Moses and others could not enter that area. It was God's symbol of his presence among his people. That was the place that they set up the temporary holy of holies where the ark of the covenant dwelt. That temple, that tabernacle at Shiloh. But yet God says, I destroyed it because they would not listen. They would not listen. I pleaded with them. I pleaded with them. And I destroyed it even though my name was there. He says, I'm going to do the same thing with Jerusalem. I'm going to do the same thing with this temple. If you do not straighten up and live the life that I'm telling you to live. Like I said, I know this isn't a shock message. But we as a church, we need to understand that there's responsibility by being a child of God. We've been called to, 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 to a life that, that, that is given over to Him, and, he, and He's saved it. See, but if you notice, before He says all of this, He's offering them what? He's offering them a way out. He's offering them forgiveness. He's offering them freedom. If only they will come back to Him. See, well, some here today might be saying, well, well, that's the Old Testament. That's the law, Pastor. And, and we're under grace. So it doesn't apply. I've heard many people say, well, that's the Old Testament. I'm here to tell you. God is still God. What was wrong in the Old Testament is wrong in the New Testament. Amen. That's right. what, he, what, he did, what he was against in the Old, he's against in the New. God does not change. Amen. What was sin in the Old is sin in the New. See, that's what makes me about some of this stuff when they talk about eternal security. One, as I was getting this message, I was talking about one. I said, you know, they sit there and they, they say, well, well God, God has forgiven me for all my sins from now until forever, so I don't have to even ask anymore. I said, so literally what you're saying is you're trying to say that, that, that he's turned your sin into righteousness. That's stupid. Sin is sin. There's no way you can make sin righteous because it's sin. But again, people will sit up there and argue and say, well, well, that's the Old Testament. That's the Old Testament. Well, we're going to look at what the New Testament has to say and what grace has to say about this subject. See, the difference between the Old and the New, the difference is that God made a way to where you could try to stop, stop obeying the law and constantly falling short to where you could live the law because you have been made a new creation and given a new heart and life through his miracle working power at a thing called at an event called salvation. See, there's a difference there. See, in the Old Testament, they had to try to obey the law. And you could not obey the law and be found guiltless of it. You were always found guilty for trying to obey the law. But what Christ does at salvation, he does a miracle thing in your life to work. He makes you literally a new person. He gives you a new heart. He gives you a new attitude to where you don't have to try to obey, but you will live the law. See, there's a difference. Because the one in your human self you're trying to fulfill something that's righteous is the other. God's made you righteous. Righteous, you will fulfill it because he changed who you are. See, Colossians 3, verses 1 through 4, we read, Since you have been raised to this new life of Christ, set your sights on the realities of heaven, where Christ sits in the place of honor at God's right hand. Think about the things of heaven, not of the things of the earth. For you died to this life, and your real life is hidden with Christ in God. And when Christ, who is your life, is revealed to the whole world, you will share in all His glory. See, he declares here that we need to do it. We need to focus. We need to realize that this life down here is only temporary. It's too many of us, when we're trying to worry about what type of car we drive, what type of job we have, how much money we have in the bank. Now, don't get me wrong. That stuff isn't wrong in and of itself. 
But it, when it becomes your priority over serving God, over living for Him, when you're, when you're trying to make money at any cost, when you're trying to, to get a home at any cost, and when, when, when you're sacrificing, serving the Lord, going to church, doing what you know you're supposed to do, doing what is right, you try to justify it, well, you know, remember I talked about the, the boxes? We try to say, well, this is my church life, this is my private life, so I can do whatever. I'm here. God, it, it, doesn't, it doesn't work that way. But we're to set our sights on reality of heaven. Since we've been raised in this new life, I'm trying to hurry on here. And he continues in verse 5, he says, So put to death the sinful, earthly things lurking within you. Have nothing to do with sexual immorality, impurity, lust, and evil desires. Do not be greedy, for a greedy person is an idolater, worshiping the things of this world. Because of these sins, God's anger is coming. Now listen to what he says in verse 7. You used to do these things when your life was still a part of this world, but now the time, but now, but now is the time to get rid of anger, rage, malicious behavior, slander, and dirty language. Don't lie to each other, for you have stripped off the old sinful nature and all its wicked deeds and put on your new nature and be renewed as you learn to know your Creator and become like Him. And the key there is what it says in that last verse that I just read. Strip off your old sinful nature and all its wicked deeds and put on your new nature and be renewed as you learn how to know your Creator and become like Him. In other words, God's saying, you need to spend time with me. See, and I was, I was telling someone else about this. The more you hang out with Him, God rubs off on you. When you, if you pray, you read your Bible, He rubs off on you. His nature starts to become your nature. And the reason why so many Christians struggle in their walk with the Lord is because they fail to spend time with Him. They think they can come on Sunday morning to get their fill and that's it. Sunday morning is important. Anytime we come together as a church to worship and praise Him, that's important because the Bible says, forsake not of assembling yourselves together. In other words, we need to come together as a group. We need to come together as a church to come together to worship and praise Him and seek His face. But also, it's more than just when we come together as a body. It's what you do in your private time. But we're to put away all of these things. Sexual immorality, impurity, lust, and evil desires. We're not to be greedy. We're to put away anger and rage and malicious behavior, slander and dirty language. Our lying. We're to put on that new nature. Be renewed. And be, be renewed and, and learn to know our Creator, become more like Him. And here's what He says. See, again, here's the greatest thing about the salvation that the Lord gives. You don't have to be some kind of special person to have it. It's just not available to whites or blacks or, 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 or yellows or reds or browns or however, you know, you know, red or yellow, black and white. They are precious in His sight. Jesus loves the little children of the world. In this new life, it doesn't matter if you are a Jew or a Gentile, circumcised or uncircumcised, barbaric, uncivilized, slave or free. Christ is all that matters. And you need, you need to understand Christ is all that matters. In this walk with Him, all that matters is Jesus. All that matters is Jesus. And He lives in all of us. Since God shows you to be the holy people He loves, you must clothe yourself with tenderhearted mercy, kindness, humility, gentleness, and patience. Make allowances for each other's faults. Forgive anyone who offends you. Remember, the Lord forgave you, so you must forgive others. Above all, clothe yourselves with love, which binds us all together in perfect harmony. Again, it goes back to what the Lord placed upon our heart about love, living our victory every day, but we have to do it in the spirit and the attitude of love, that actual agape love, that love of God for each other. By, by this shall all men know you are my disciples if you have love one for another. That's what we're called to be as His people. To have love for each other. And to forgive each other because of love. We can't let anything that anybody has done hurt us so badly that we're not willing to let it go. That we're not willing to let go of the baggage so we can walk in the freedom that He's given us. 
See, too many times when we fail to let it go and allow Satan to get a foothold in our lives and then he allows these other things to creep in and begin to come and cause a destroying factor in your life. Allow them to get a grip and a hold into you. And he says, let the peace that comes from Christ rule in your hearts. For as members of one body, you are called to live in peace. Always be thankful. Let the message about Christ and all its richness fulfill your lives. Teach and counsel each other with all the wisdom He gives. Sing songs and hymns and spiritual songs to God with thankful hearts. And in verse 17, And whatever you do or say, do it as a representative of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to Him, to God the Father. We need to understand. I did it again. We need to understand that it's all about who. It's about Him. We are, when we say that we're a Christian, we represent Him. And we need to make sure that, that, that what they see is Jesus. The Jesus of the Bible, the real Jesus, the one who has love and compassion before he ever walked. Jesus, when you really think about the only people he condemned, do you remember? He didn't, he didn't condemn sinners down here. Do you realize that? He didn't go up to a sinner and say, You old vile, smelly, stinking sinner, you're going to hell. Did he ever say that to any sinner? Think about it. You won't find it in the Gospels. But what he did do, he got on the self righteous. He got on those who, who thought they were holy. Their poop didn't stink. He did. I mean, he, he ripped them up one side and down the other. Because it's not about who you think you are. It's who he says you are. It's who he says you are. And whether or not you live it. And we need to understand that we're a representative of the Lord Jesus. Giving thanks to him. To God the Father. There's a whole portion of scripture I want to read. Right here. But again, talking about, see, the, 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 this is what Paul's telling the church at Coas about if we have this new life, this is what needs to be happening. But to hit a little bit more home and get directly more into dealing with sin, can we let sin continue to do certain things? I'm going to read to what, church, what Paul wrote to the church at Rome. In Romans chapter 6, verses 12 through 18. Listen to what it says. Do not let sin control the way you live. Do not give in to sinful desires. Do not let any part of your body become an instrument of evil to serve sin. Instead, give yourselves completely to God. For you were dead, but now you have a new life. Use your whole body as an instrument to do what is right for the glory of God. Listen to what it says in verse 14. Sin is no longer your master. For you no longer live under the requirement of the law. Instead, you live under the freedom of God's grace. And I can see it now. See, when we read that, we say, oh, man, that means the sins are under grace. That means we don't have to worry about sin no more, right? Theoretically, yes. That's what he intends, yes. Because he says you live under the freedom of God's grace. Listen to what he says in verse 15. Well then, since God's grace has set us free from the law, does that mean we can go on sinning? What was his answer? Of course, go ahead. Isn't that what he said? What did he say? Of course not. We cannot go on sinning. Don't you realize that you become the slave of whatever you choose to obey? You can be a slave to sin, which leads to death, or you can choose to obey God, which leads to righteous living. I'm going to stop there. See, we can sit there and come to, to an altar of salvation. God can come in and, and begin. you can be realize you need Him. But if you don't get it from that place and allow Him to begin to change your heart and your life, and you continue to obey sin, you become a slave to sin. And right there in the Scripture we say, Sin leads to what? Death. It leads to death, which means it leads to the judgment of God. He says, or you can choose to obey God, which leads to right, 
Righteous living, which means if we choose to obey God, we choose to follow Him, what does that mean? It means there should be something different about our life. Our life should be our life of righteousness. Now, am I saying you're going to be perfect? No, I am not. But we should be striving to live a life of perfection for Him. We should be striving to live a right, right, a right, a right life for the Lord. We can't just keep on just allowing our sin to get a hold of it. Because if you do that, literally what you're saying, you are still a slave to sin. You may, you may have experienced the power of God. You may have experienced the anointing of God. But you have not truly experienced the freedom of God. Thank God once you were slaves of sin. But now you... you doesn't this word sound familiar? But now you wholeheartedly. What does that mean? <laughs> with all of your heart. With all of your life. With everything that is in you. But you now wholeheartedly. How many of us can truly say that we are wholeheartedly obeying? You now wholeheartedly obey this teaching we, we have been given. You are now free from your slavery to sin. You have become slaves to righteous living. And here's the thing. If you're not living righteous, that means you're living unrighteous. And that means you're not living in the freedom and the life that God has for you and He desires for you. You're still holding on to the baggage. Church, as Jeremiah went to the people of Judah and basically told them, I'm going to put very modern terms, stop playing around with God. If you become serious with Him, His blessings are going to be upon you. And He won't remove you from this place. But don't sit there and fool yourself thinking that as long as I come and I feel the presence of God, I can do from holler and do all this stuff and everything will be okay and I can go do what I want to do. It's not going to work. It's not going to work. There yeah. will come a time when He will stop. And He'll give you over to your own evil desires. And He'll no longer try to draw you in. He'll no longer let His Holy Spirit pull at your heart. And I don't want to see anybody ready to that point. I think that's why God had me stop by here today. Stop by with this message, even though it was hard to transition from you guys love me to where now you may not be happy with me. But the thing is, as long as you make yourself right with the Lord, I don't care if you're happy. Because I'm more concerned about you making your heaven. more concerned about you fulfilling what you said, what you wanted when you came and asked Jesus to be the Lord of your heart. I don't want you to be a liar about that. I don't want you to bring reproach to his name, shame to his name. I want you to be the child he's called you. I want you to live and walk in the freedom he wants you to have. You have to be the one to sign up. Who, who chooses besides to live and walk in? You have to be the one to decide to put the baggage down and truly leave it at the foot of the cross. Leave it at the altar and not pick it up again. Whether sin or other things. Because He does desire for you to live in freedom. He does desire to pour his, the joy of His salvation over your life. But you have to be the one to truly accept it and walk. He's not going to make you. He's not going to push you. But as your 
pastor or have to point you down the right road. And if things aren't right, I've got to tell you. So what do we do now? I want you to listen to the invitation that God gives in Isaiah. Isaiah 55, verses 6 through 7 says, Seek the Lord while you can find Him. Call on Him while He is near. I'm here to tell you, He's near today. He's present. So call on Him while He's near. Listen to what it says in verse 7. Let the wicked change their ways and banish the very thought of doing wrong. Let them turn to the Lord that He may have mercy on them. See again, God desires to give mercy. He desires to give forgiveness. God is not willing that any should perish, but that all come to repentance. Yes, turn to our God, for He will forgive generously. Thank you, Lord. Will you stand for like I said, maybe throughout this week, if you were here last week, maybe there was some baggage that you picked back up, or maybe there was some baggage you didn't let go of. Maybe there's some sins you're constantly going back to. I'm here to tell you, you don't have to do that. You can have the freedom that the Lord declares. You can. You can check it out. And again, I remember that the our daily bread today is dealing with what we dealt with last week. About casting our care upon Him. Letting go of the baggage. And I believe He's still calling today to let it go. Let it go. Let it go. Give it to me. Give it to me. Give it to me. Walk in the life that I desire for you. That's what the Lord is saying. And while he's here today, come before him with a truly repentant heart. Let's not just go through emotions today, but let's truly come and say, Lord, a minute say I've had it wrong. I've had it wrong. And Lord, I truly want to pursue you with all my heart, with all my mind with all my soul, with all my strength, Lord. I truly want what the, what the greatest commandment is. I want that to be alive in my life. So I can truly be that new creation that you desire for me to be. See, see we have to come with the Lord in heart. And He'll take care of the rest. And as, as we said so many times, we got to be the ones that we, we have to take that step, that step of faith. That's speaking of you this morning. I'm going to ask you to slip from where you are. See, this may not be a message for everybody here. It may, it may be for one person. It may be for several. I don't know. Maybe it's for all of us. But I know he gave you this message for a reason. And I don't want to want you to leave this place touched by His presence. And again, don't worry about what people are going to think. Because honestly, if this is talking about you today, if this is talking about your life, so much of my heart wants you to truly get it. Shake it down. So where you can truly be the child that He's called you to be. That's you while we sing. Step out from where you are and make your way to this altar. Give your heart to Him. Even if there's something you might need to write down again, write it down. Fold it up. We'll deal with it later. But we'll give it to Him. But let this be your cry today. Sit let this be your cry.
Señor.